Uh, welcome to our talk this afternoon. I want to preface this talk. I'm not going to talk for very long, okay, because I really want you to listen to our guests today. Uh, but we're talking about a very important topic here today. When we talk about food, we're talking about something that impacts all of us as we sit here enjoying our, our cookies, right, which fits in right with what we're talking about today. Uh, this is a topic which is uh, growing, I think, in concern, and it's going to be growing in the future with the what's happening with Canadian demographics and demographics across the world. I don't think there's a week that goes by that you don't see a story about issues with food safety in the news. And these are all areas that are actually really quite amenable to improvement through technology. Um, you know, and I think in some ways, I mean, I actually come from the software and the digital tech industry, but one of the things I kind of noticed the more I've been learning about the food industry is the enormous potential here. It almost seems like an untouched frontier when I look at it from a technological standpoint. And to me, that means the potential for innovation, for growth, and to be truly outstanding. Okay? And that's why we have our speakers here today and to talk about a bit of their, their vision for this, okay? because this is also an area that has strong ties to the Waterloo region. And there's a lot of strong historical reasons why we could be truly great in this area. So I want to thank you for coming today, uh, for participating today. We'll have a question and answer que session afterwards. I'll have Christina take the microphone to you, so please wait for her to come because that helps us record it. So this is being recorded for access on the internet later. It will be on the Center for Bioengineering and Biotechnology YouTube channel, so please check in. Um, all our seminars have been recorded on that, so it's a really nice resource for you. And so I encourage you to enjoy the talks and think really, really hard about this area and the potential of it and how you could get engaged in it. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Mayor Brent Howard. So I, I want to thank Catherine and, um, f and all of you for, for coming out this afternoon and listening to uh, Ted and I speak about this initiative that we've been working on for almost three years now. And to be able to now be able to, s to speak in front of a group of, of, you know, really incredible group of people who are pretty excited about this maybe, because you're here and you're not sure, food technology, as Catherine said, is, is, has a, an enormous potential. And I think Canada is poised to be the country that uh, will be the, the food technology giant. And I'll, I'll give you a bit of a background on it. And I'm really excited about it. I'm really passionate about it. And I'm, I'm so excited that UW, through, through uh, BioEng, is, is looking at this and, and kind of keeping your minds open to, to opportunities that each and every one of you could um, take the charge and, and lead us forward in, as, as a city and as a university and as a region and as a country. So a little bit of background, um, I'm the Mayor of Waterloo and some of the things that I've gone through over the past many years is seeing a lot of changes within the, the region and kind of looking at how, uh, where technology is going and, and of course, we, you know, to me the elephant in the room everywhere I go is Blackberry and the changes that Blackberry is going through and kind of the, the, um, the, the change in, in what we need to be looking at is how do we move forward and, and what's the next technology that we should be looking at and, and how do we diversify our local economy and make ourselves um, uh, even more competitive and attract more businesses here, but, but in a broader sense. So um, about three years ago, Ted McKechnie, uh, Tim Anderson, who is the CAO of the City of Waterloo, and myself uh, were on a business calling um, meeting with um, Pillars, and Pillars is one of the largest food processors of meat in Canada and uh, globally known. So we're sitting talking to Willie Huber, who's the president of Pillars, and I've known Willie for many, many years, and we we're kind of talking about just his business business and, and some of the, the um, challenges he's going through. And I don't know anything about meat processing, but Ted does. Ted knows everything about food, so I just look to Ted and say, I don't know. But I'm learned, believe me, I've learned a lot since we've started on, on this, uh, this journey of, of creating a food technology center of excellence in this region. So uh, Willie said to me, you know, Brenda, I have to go to Germany to buy any type of fabricated equipment for my, my, uh, my plants, because he has quite a few manufacturing plants. I have to go to Germany to hire people because we're not churning grads out you know, through the colleges. It's very difficult to find people who want to work in, in the, the um, meat production industry. And um, I shouldn't have to be doing this. Like, look at the technology around us. Look at where we live. We've got universities here. We've got the colleges here. We're like the breadbasket of Ontario. And he said, I shouldn't have to go to Germany to get all the, the products I need to create my business here in, in Waterloo. And he, I said, hello, he's absolutely, <laughs> Conestoga College is here. And he said, he's absolutely right. So I looked at, right here, Ted Luis is here. 
happy to have you here. Okay. So we, and who else? Hi, Julie. I'm, I'm just trying to make eye contact with everybody in the room. So as we uh, had this discussion, um, he said, you know, Brenda, we have an opportunity to create a food technology cluster here in Waterloo because nobody else has really done it yet. And I looked at Tim, the CAO, and of course, as mayor, I look at the CAO and say, yeah. And then I looked at Ted and I said, we're going to do that. We have to do that. And we all three agreed, as well as Willie Huber. So we've been doing this for three years. And, you know, I thought it would be an easy thing to get going. But as each and every one of you know, it takes a while to get good ideas promoted even further. So we've had kind of an interesting journey, and Ted will talk to it a, a little bit, because there's been some kind of, well, food. You know, who cares about food? Well, the whole world cares about food. And technology, it just makes sense, especially at UW, and especially with Conestoga College, because they have the, a, a big facility set up for this already. How can we take the skill set that already exists in the region and do the next big thing? And the next big thing, as we believe, is food technology, food security, food storage, food transportation. I've had the great uh, benefit of traveling to China and to India on behalf of the city through some of our, our um, business missions. And I'm telling you, if you, I'm sure many of you have traveled to these countries, and once, once you've been there, you realize the need for great food technology, especially around food safety and security. So as I've had these years of, of traveling and, and been concerned myself of what I'm eating in some of these places, um, the last one was when I was in India and seeing the huge potential market for even one great idea, because India is massive, China is massive, South Africa, you look at the developing nations who would be looking for some food technology cluster to create the technology that they could use in their respective countries and save lives save children's lives, provide a safe source of food for, for people. And I, I look as a Canadian, our responsibility, and I believe our responsibility is to help the world. And food technology, if we can provide the technology and, and the opportunities to create a product that will, will make water um, pure, will make sure that in India children aren't, aren't drinking impure milk that's been tainted, that we can do all sorts of things. Can we help India with their food uh, transportation storage problems. I was told that out of 99% of the food that, or almost 95% of the food that's produced is wasted because they can't have no storage facilities. They can't get it from the farms to the restaurants and to the food producers. We can fix all of that. We have an opportunity right now to put not only our region, but our, our province, and I believe our country, my long-term vision is that Canada will, could become the go-to nation for food security and food, food um, technology. So that if, if someone in another developing country or a country globally sees made in Canada or Canadian sta safety standards stamp on it, they know it's a trusted food source. We can do that. So we're looking at now how do we match up the technology with the food processing world, with the food producers. And that's what Ted has been doing for several years now. Um, we've created Canada's Technology for Food Initiative. The city has provided $200,000 in seed funding because we believe in it as a new economic development um, promoter for this, this community. I look at the jobs that could be created that will come to this region and what the technology and the, the um, ideas that are created here. We commercialize commercialize them here, we create them here, we sell them and market them globally. We can do this. And all of you in this room have the potential of creating this with us. So I want to plant that seed of, of excitement, of opportunity. Every single person in this world needs a good source of food and, and uh, clean water and, and clean milk. And let's do it. Let's, let's all find those opportunities because Nobody's picked it up, as, and we have this opportunity now, and I think it's a really timely time for us to be talking about this as uh, in Waterloo, in Waterloo Region. So I, um, I'm excited about it. And we have uh, now have set up an advisory board. We are at the Accelerator Centre. We are, are working with pillars on um, projects, so we're now starting to see results of years and years of meetings. Mr. McKechnie has met with thousands of people and has, pr has promoted this vision and this dream. And uh, we're making inroads, but a day like today for me is so exciting because your people with ideas in this world who could make the change. 
you might have the technology right now at your fingertips and thinking, I don't know what to do with this. I've, I've created this. I've invented this. I know I can do this. Well, how are we going to match you up with opportunities? And that's what we, we see happening. So I, I don't really need to speak that long because Ted has quite a lot to share with you. But I really appreciate your interest and the interest of UW and, and uh, BioEngine and your leadership, Catherine. Thank you. And thank you, Shirley, for, for organizing this and, and bringing us here. Because I think, I think we all know that this could be something really exciting. I do. I, I've been doing this for years. I have no doubt this is the next big thing for this region. But also as Canadian, I think about where are we going to be in 50 years after they, our water and trees and minerals are gone. Like, where are, what are we going to be doing? Food technology can be done all across Canada in a big way. So that's my big term vision. There's what, 34 million Canadians. The city of Chongqing is a friend of Waterloo. I signed a friendship agreement with Chongqing in China. Biggest city in the world. They have the population of Canada. They could use our technology. And there's lots more people who can. So we might be small, but we are mighty and we are creative. We are Canadians, A. Eh? So I now would love to, to tell you about someone who is, is so important to me and so special to me, and it's Ted McKechnie. And uh, we've known each other for several years now, and we both sit in meetings in uh, complete, I think, great respect for each other. And I've sat in meetings and listened to him, and every time I listen to him, I just think how fortunate this city is, and I am, and this initiative is to have Ted at the helm. Ted is probably one of the biggest food guys in Canada. And I've learned that there's meat guys, there's chicken guys, there's, there's like wheat guys and soybean guys. And my husband for years was the executive director of the Soybean Marketing Board, so I know all about soybeans. Like, who knows about soybeans? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we drive by fields and he tells me all about them. I think, oh, this is, now it's interesting. But I used to pretend when we were dating that I was interested. <laughs> but um, now that we're married, it's like, really? But anyways, no, I do. I do pay attention. So uh, Ted and I have been doing this for quite a long time. And uh, here's Ted's, Ted's incredible bio. He's a senior executive with extensive board and senior management experience in the consumer goods, resource, and service industries. He has a proven track record for achieving corporate financial growth objectives and is an expert in turning around troubled businesses. And I know he's good at this because he hasn't given up on this. And there have been times when we want to, right, Ted? There have been times we think, oh, maybe we just should give up. Mm -hmm. And then we look at each other and say, never, no, we've got to keep doing this. Ted is a disciplined strategic thinker with the ability to lead organizations successfully through change. His leadership style is characterized by energy and innovation with a passion for excellence in building effective, highly motivated teams. And believe me, he motivates our team. He has received the Philip Morris Chairman's Award for recognition of extraordinary contributions having a significant and lasting impact on the corporation. Now listen to what Ted has done. He has been at Kraft. He's been the, the past president of General Foods. I don't have all your big titles. I think you're like the president of everything, right? So like Kraft, General Foods, Frito-Lay, Pepsi, president and CEO of the Davies Group of Companies, president and CEO of the Ethnic Food Group International and Corporate, president and COO owner of Humpty Dumpty Foods, president and COO of Maple Leaf Foods and Corporate, President and CEO of MenuAtHome.com, and most recently, he, he is our Chairman and CEO of Canada's Technology for Food. Now, if you want to know about food, there's the guy. This is the food guy. And Ted will say to me, oh, I know, uh, I'll talk to so-and-so, and I know so-and-so, he knows, he knows everybody. I just sit in awe. Like, I thought I knew a lot of people, but um, I just am very appreciative of Ted because Ted believes in this, and uh, Ted is, as given so much of his personal time. Believe me, we don't pay him much. I don't know even if we pay you 10 cents an hour with all the amount of time he puts in because he's passionate about it, he believes in it, and he's, he's feeling as, as much as I am the determination, the excitement, and um, the, the complete um, um, determination, I guess is the best word, that we're going to make this an, an incredibly successful initiative for this region, for Ontario, and eventually for Canada. So, without any further ado, I want to introduce you to my good, good friend, Ted McKechnie. Thank you, Ted. I guess well, I'd like to thank uh, Catherine, I'd like to thank Thur Shirley for the opportunity to talk to, talk to the group. Um, and it's really important, what I'm trying to do is, is get you excited about the food business, and that's really important to us. And it's important, it should be important ultimately to, uh, to all of us. 
Mayor Halloran is not running again, unfortunately, but in any government area, when you're trying to get something done, you need a mayor who has got a vision, you need a mayor who has got a collaborative style, and a mayor who is, understands the business side. And this is a quote that at some point Brenda said, and, and she engendered it to all of us, and that's find a business you love and manage with a passion. And she's taken her passion and she's focused it on food and technology. So, Mayor Haller and I really appreciate it, and uh, this wouldn't be where it was if it weren't for you and your vision and your passion. And we've, we've all added a little bit of passion to uh, this initiative. Um, I'm gonna talk about the, the market, Canada's Tech for Food, collaboration to commercialization, some opportunities. We, we talked to food processors about future food technology trends, and then you know, open discussion, how we might work together and any questions you, you might have uh, on, on anything. Um, Brenda talked about this. Sorry, I shouldn't say Brenda. Mayor Halloran talked about this. I wanted to add this. This is kind of a personal thing, but uh, my great-great-grandfather was named William Davies, and he started a meat business in Toronto in, in the 1890s. This William Davies ultimately morphed and evolved into Canada Packers, one of the divisions of Canada Packers. And ultimately, Canada Packers and Maple Leaf Mills were brought together and became Maple Leaf Foods. Now, Toronto is called Hogtown as a result of William Davies exporting hogs to the UK. And this was a family myth for years. And I said, well, I'm not going to tell too many people because I'm not sure it's true. One day, I look in the Globe and Mail and it says, why is Toronto called Hogtown? I said, well, I'll find out. And it talked about William Davies and the meatpacking industry in the 1890s and the shipment of hogs to, to the UK. So, I'm very proud of that, and I've been in the food business 30 to 40 years, a lot of years, and sometimes they call me Ted McFoodie. So I'd like to talk about the beginning. I'd like to end to uh, Brenda's comments about, about pillars. And, and there's, Mayor Halloran should take a little more credit, but in January 2011, and we're now in 2014, uh, Mayor Halloran suggested that the region, the city, needs a more balanced portfolio to be a vibrant and economic area. And this was amid some of the Blackberry softness and those kinds of things. And in March 2011, the Waterloo Economic Development Committee, of which I was co-chair at the time, had, had, was going to have monthly meetings to set up and review industry opportunities and say, let's pick an industry, let's see a whole bunch of them and see what we can, what we can do. In April 2011, the first industry segment that we talked about, I volunteered with OMAFRA. OMAFRA set up the Canadian market, the Ontario market, and then I talked about how do you leverage, how do we leverage technology and how do we leverage food? Because food is under service by the technology business. So we created a subcommittee. Uh, Mayor Halloran was asked to attend the meetings, seven o'clock meetings, and I don't think there was one that Mayor Halloran missed. And this is really important, and we had really good five subcommittee, Tim Anderson, Dwayne Priestman, Darren Schneider, uh, uh, Grant Genridge, and Paul Pupolo, and I wish they were here today because they were measurably in help to make this thing go on. But what we did is we spent three years, or two years, I should say, researching and talking to food processors talking to, to accelerators, talking to academic institutions, talking to fabricators and technology integrators to try and get and understand what the food processing business needed. We also talked to the auto, we talked to the president of Ford, president of General Motors and said, when you transition to technology, what was the, what was the model? Help us, we don't wanna make the same mistakes as you made. And, and we, talked, you know, we talked to Ray Tange of, of Toyota and all those people. The information came together, the CTF business model was created, and we went off and asked and met with food processors to identify technology challenges that could dramatically impact their business. Originally, it was called Waterloo's Technology for Food. And Mayor Halloran and the rest of us said, this isn't a Waterloo Region initiative. This isn't a Waterloo initiative. It's an initiative that started in Waterloo and that's leveraging the incredible technology cluster 
in Waterloo Region, but this is a national, this is an Ontario play. So we changed it to Canada's technology for food. Now, we linked with the Accelerator Center and Communitech because the most successful and the only really successful technology cluster is in Waterloo Region. There are really none of the size and scope in Canada other than the Waterloo Tech Cluster. And what we wanted to do is we, we, we don't have any offices. We use City Hall for offices. We use the Common Room Accelerator Center because we're trying to keep our fixed costs low. We want to be a virtual business. So if we want a P&L done, the Waterloo Accelerator Center does it. If we, want, if, we, if we wanted a website, we're not spending money on a website right now, the Accelerator Center, and they would bill us on a low cost basis or, or Communitech. So that's why our fixed cost will range between $200,000 and $300,000, and we believe our variable side will range in the two to 10 or $20 million over many years, because our focus is on solving food processor problems with technology. We've got seed funding from Waterloo, came through with seed funding. Obviously, you need some money to start and initiate and talk. Came from Waterloo, $200,000. We believe that the region and its other entities will also give us some seed funding and we'll work through and, and fight through that as we, as we move. We were incorporated in 2013, December, it took us a long time. We have a trademark, we have the trademark Canada's Tech for Food. We initiated pilot projects in January 2014 and I'll talk a little more about that. Pillars, Brick and Conestoga Meats and what we were trying to do is we have 30 to 40 food processor challenges from 50 or 60 food processors. But what we wanted to do, we said, listen, we want to prove the pilots first. We don't want to do them all at once. We, we will ultimately bring them into the fold as, as we move forward. So CTFF, we're a national nonprofit organization we're the only technology for food group in Canada. We want to grow technology. We've got to, to, make, to optimize technology business. Cities need a balanced portfolio. Technology needs a balanced portfolio. The largest single category, other than auto, is food. And technology needs to be and is an enabler for all other business ecosystems. And I'm going to say in particular, food. Our promise is that we will work collaboratively with the food industry partners to identify challenges and opportunities for individual food processor and food industry improvement. So we work with individual food processors to ultimately commercialize for the industry. The beauty of our model, and we'll talk more about it, is the consortium that we use, the collaboration. We'll talk about collaboration to commercialization. At that point, then we'll match the industry partner with a consortium of a solution providers that will solve that challenge. So it's food processor, technology integrator, fabricator, academic institution. And that is unique in the food business. And we, we adapted that from the model, from the auto model. It said, here's how we can be successful if you follow this model. And there were other people giving us advice, but when we went to Otto and other, and when we went to Europe and asked Holland and, England and, and Germany, they specifically identified when the solution is potential to the benefit the rest of the food industry, we'll work with a consortium, the Accelerator Center, Communitech, obviously to commercialize the technology and grow the food business. So in its simplest form, we use collaboration consortium to bring technology to food. It's not just food processing, it's packaging, it's supply chain, it's food safety, it's effluence, and it's data, data integration by line, from line to line, and from line, plant, to management, and, and out. I wanna just talk, I don't know how many know that the Premier, Catherine Wynne, challenged us the food industry in Ontario and said by 2020 I want to double your annual growth in the food business and I want to create 120,000 new jobs. Now accelerating the growth in the 
sector requires collaboration between government and industry. And it's important to understand that more than food producers and processor growth is required to it to deliver those targets. So if we just said, well, we'll grow, we'll grow producer, which is farms, we'll grow processors, that's an important part, but we need to go beyond that. And just let's step back, and this is something that, that Mayor Halloran talked about. Almost 85% of tech for food equipment is purchased in Europe. Canada's share of that $100 billion business is less than 1%. So we're not a big tech for food equipment maker. Canada and Ontario's payoff is to export food products. That's what we want to do. We want to be competitive and we want to sell technology for food equipment in Canada, increase our share, and ultimately to the world. Now that's going to take some time. But what that means is effectively existing food technology integrators and fabricators have to grow, and they will, and new food technology integrators and fabricators will have to develop. And that's not going to happen in the next year, but over a period of five or ten years, with a focus, that will continue to, continue to happen. Quickly, the Canadian food market. There's producers and processors. Producers are the farmers, processors are the manufacturers. There's a multiple segments. There's bakery, pasta, protein, you know, meat, poultry, seafood, chocolate, confectionery, beverage, dairy, fruit and vegetables. And I'm sure Gordon, there may be a couple that I miss, but it just says that the food isn't just a simple business. When you just when you eat it three times a day, or like some of us more than three times a day, Jason, um, <laughs> you know how important food is. But the Canadian food processing industry generated a hundred billion dollars in economic activity annually. Hundred billion dollars. The only market that's bigger is the auto, and for two years. Food was bigger than auto, and it employs 300,000 Canadians. Now, the Ontario food processing industry generates almost 40% of national, 39 to $40 billion, and directly employs 125,000 people. Now, the Alliance of Food Processors, of Ontario Food Processors, in a, in a study recently, believes that the Ontario food and beverage can grow to 108, grow to 185 thousand direct jobs and over 70 billion that's not quite as Steve Peters isn't quite as consistent as doesn't match the numbers at the premier so I think we'll believe the premier Steve Peters is is the executive director of Alliance of Ontario food processors and is the ex um, Ontario um, agriculture minister in the in the McGuinty government what are the region market? Food is, again, food is the second largest. When people talk food and we talk about, this is a big market. Well, of course it's big. And I'm saying food and auto are huge. And I'm, technology is an enabler. If you look at the size of the technology business, it's 50, 60 on, on the list in terms of market size. That's not demeaning the technology, but it says to optimize and grow the technology business over time to keep it growing, it needs to be an enabler for other industries. And we're specifically saying we're targeting, we're targeting food. There's also a multiplier effect. For every job in food, there's a minimum of four jobs are created by the broader economy. And that's significant, and that's important. Waterloo Region industry generated four billion in economic activity, directly employs almost 13,000 people. Producers, farmers, employ 35% of, of the jobs and deliver 20% of the dollars, and processors employ 65% of the jobs and 80% of, of the dollars. I think we all know Waterloo includes obviously seven local municipalities, and we're gonna get everybody to in Waterloo Region to be focusing on the same thing and working with all of us on this initiative. Waterloo Region covers 135,000 hectares and with a day's drive, 130 million people. Within 700 kilometers, there's 130 million people. So one of the things when we were in Europe, the access to the US from Canada, because I like dealing with Canada, is an important piece. And we've got that corridor just locked up. 
Guadalupe is still predominantly agriculture or food based. Approximately 65% of the land obviously is agriculture production. And Waterloo region does lag the province for all food manufacturing, but we exceed the province on the meat side because of pillars, because of DC foods, because of Amira poultry, because of Grand River foods. And that happens to be focused because of the 1,444 farms, many of them obviously are, li are livestock. And they use over 226,000 acres of, uh, of land. Wanted to talk a little bit about the consumer market. And I am going through this quickly because there's a lot to cover. Well, there's a time for, for questions, but sustainability is an important consumer trend. It's stop wasting food, and we'll talk about that. There is a social responsibility. And in, in India, 95% of the food is wasted from the farm. So if you have $100, $5 gets to the consumer. In, Can in, in Canada, in the world, we waste 40% from the farm to the consumer. And we'll talk a little more about that. Health and wellness, low sodium, gluten-free, organics, whatever you want, is very important. The boomer reality, of which I think I'm one, aging, you know, diabetes, which is coming. We're more concerned about what we put into our mouth and we should be, all of us should be. Food safety, obviously who makes it, how it's made, is this good product, where do I buy it, those kinds of things. Tastes are evolving and changing. The ethnic food growth is 30 to 40% over the last 10 years. I had a company called Ethnic Food Group International. I was able to take that and grow that by almost 50% because of the tastes in North America are dramatically changing. They're, we've expanded, we're much more cosmopolitan. You know, you first you see the Chinese, you know, the Chinese, the Indian, you know, the, uh, you know, the Middle East food, and next comes, obviously you see it in grocery stores. What do you see in, in, in all the regular grocery stores? You see ethnic food. A little customized to Canada, of course. We've got tech savvy consumers. And as we get into the future of technology and food, you know, online ordering and shopping. Um, especially phone apps on ingredients. There was something at the Accelerator Center called My Food Facts. It didn't do well. I think that the software was good. And what it did is on an iPhone, you could bring it in, scope the product code, and you could identify the specific ingredient, whether it was gluten in it, whether it wasn't in it. And it gave you very detailed analysis for, you know, for those that are interested. And I think that this consumer is really sophisticated. The importance of the consumer the important, consumer is important in the context of all of what we're doing from a technology and a food standpoint. And I guess the last thing is just, consumers used to try just about everything, they still do, but one of the things happening now is, consumers used to try it, they liked it, they'd buy it, and kind of get to regular usage, then ultimately decide after a while, I don't really like this, I'm gonna stop buying it. Now, there's a sophistication here. You know, consumer is three successful trials, and this is a, broad, a broadly um, used term, trial at three successful times to convert to regular usage. And to have a business, a sustainable business, you need regular usage. Keep getting trial and trial and trial, you're not gonna have a successful business. So if you have, the second time you try it, you don't like it, you may not go back again, you go back, you start the, tri the three trials over again. And that's, an, that's a really important piece. Technology for food equipment market, the global size 50 to 100 million dollars. And that was a study that came out of uh, CTT um, that isn't published yet, but will be published soon, Jason. Um, technology for food lags other industry, not because technology didn't want to get into food, is because food has not been as proactive as they should be. We think the potential size of the tech for food equipment market is at least double because worldwide there are issues on productivity and technical use in food. 90% of Canadian equipment purchased, we talked about that, Canada's share of the global market. If you're getting into food, now's the time to get into food. Five years from now, it could be crowded. So please get in now and, and help us with this initiative. Key learning. 
We spent two years talking to food processors, small and medium-sized businesses, fabricators, technology integrators, and these were in-depth interviews. This wasn't questionnaire that we sent out and you know they flipped through it in five minutes. These were three-hour interviews that we spent and devoted a ton of time to make sure that we understood. So there's, I would say there's nobody that understands a small and medium-sized business in Ontario better than CTFF does. And there's some things that came out of that in our mind that is key learning. So don't shoot the messenger. So food and beverage processing ranks second last in productivity growth among Ontario's manufacturing sector. I think everybody understands that. Waterloo Region, though, is the convergence of all that is good about food and technology. What an incredible opportunity. Waterloo Region Tech Cluster is the only successful tech cluster in Canada with the Waterloo Accelerator Center, Communitech, the hubs, Velocity, all those things. I mean, you combine food <coughs> and technology and you've got an incredible technology for food ecosystem. You combine a technology ecosystem, a food ecosystem, and we always include, quite frankly, you know, Wellington, Guelph in our super region. I mean, we have to because it's an important part. We don't, you know, this is part of collaboration that's required in, in the industry. Um, Waterloo Region Agriculture is supported by food processors, by Conestoga College, and, and Louis Garcia is here today and on the, on the CTFF board. University of Guelph, I'm meeting with Robert Gordon. I meet with him every month and we, we talk about how we can engage students and professors and one of the professors is on the board, Gord Surgener, president of OAFT, is on the board. I think it's a who's who of the food, the government, um, industry, technology industry in Ontario, and I think in, in obviously in Canada. The next point is SME food processors do not have the skill set or time or resources to apply for government incentives. And they say, oh, that's baloney, they should. The reality is they feel they don't and they don't. Now, should they be proactive? Sure. Bruce Archibald talked about the number of food shred claims is the lowest of any industry in Ontario because they just don't apply. Don't ask me why, but they, sim they simply don't. But that's the nature of the small and medium sized size business. S SMEs don't have the capacity to invest in innovative productivity improvements. Access to cash is tough. They're, you know, they're breaking even. You know, they're probably, they're entrepreneurs who were good at one thing, as in a product developer or a manufacturing guy or a sales guy who had a product that he could sell. And entrepreneurs don't know what they don't know and they don't tend to bring sometimes the right people in. So there, obviously there's a lot of help that, that's required. I think importantly, then this came, this came regularly from food processors. Um, small and large, focus on high-tech industries from a Canada-wide standpoint has led to a more narrow focus on traditional food processing and, and producers. So a bit of an unbalanced portfolio. And that's what Mayor Halloran tried to do and set this up as a catalyst in Waterloo Region for Ontario and for Canada to make, to make that work. Technology must be the enabler of business, and you've heard that a number of times. But to optimize the technology business, it can't be just high tech, it's gotta be technology enabling other industries, and that's important. And Canada's food ecosystem goes beyond producers and processors, as I said earlier. I mean, it includes the whole value chain. And in particular, you know, the technology integrators and the fabricators and those kinds of people. SMEs are searching for advanced manufacturing technology that is immediate, practical, and it works. They're not, waiting, they're not willing to wait three years. They need for them to put cash and skin in the game. And Gordon and I have had many chats about this. And this is tough to get them to put cash in the game because they feel they've been burned. When you get them to put cash in the game, they want something that has a payback in a short period of time and that works. Now, nothing is guaranteed. Um, and we've been able to work through that, and I'll talk about that. Technology serves the food processor best when it's defined in their terms and delivered as such. 
if it's defined in, if a fabricator technology integrator defines it in their terms and then sends it back, SMEs tend to be in, intimidated, particularly on the academic level. They're very, they're dealing with PhDs. These people don't, don't, uh, don't have, you know, that kind of education, they're, they're intimidated. We gotta make sure that the end user who's using this technology thinks it's right and it's defined properly. And in, in some cases, in many cases when we talk to them, they said, I've done projects, but I didn't, and believe it or not, this is stupid. I didn't have the guts to tell them it wasn't defined quite right. So I ended up, spent X dollars and I didn't get it right. Or they didn't get it right, so I don't like them. Um, I guess the, the other thing is, I think this is the, the, one of the final ones, but best practices must think global, not local. And I guess one of the things that when we asked in Eindhoven and Holland and Germany, when Waterloo Region went there for, for a number of weeks to meet potential uh, investors in, in Waterloo Region, and we asked them, you know, what could we do better? How do you see Canada? How do you look at, how do you look at Ontario? How do you look at Waterloo Region? And they certainly, and, and their overall comment was about Canadians, you guys sit down and talk to each other about best practices. We talk to the world for best practices. So you get Canadian best practices, but you don't do the world's best practices. And someplace in the middle is the truth. I don't know where it is, but someplace in the middle is gonna be the truth. Just some quick news, BlackBerry layoffs, a problem. We're gonna get by it, BlackBerry's gonna survive. I think, I think Mayor Heller's done a great job of, of taking the positive side with, with a very negative, negative press. Heinz closes Leamington, 740 people. They didn't reinvest. Kellogg closes the London plant. Cargill laying out 300 in London, taking them to another plant. The issue here is the US treat us now as more like satellites and branch plants than they ever did before. When I first started in the food business, I will tell you, I mean, Canada was valuable. It wasn't treating us, uh, us as a satellite. Now when the world has become global, Canada's a satellite and those big businesses will potentially disappear. We're not gonna lose all the big businesses, but we're gonna lose a lot of them. So the SMEs need to be the focus to drive GDP, and that's really important. We need to show a point of difference. We need to drive productivity innovation with obviously innovative advanced manufacturing technology. The food industry is in urgent need of transition to technology. SMEs in particular, as I said, and we talked about 85% of the food or 90% depending on what it is and what our, what our share is. Um, just quickly, our vision, and this is important, I'm not gonna spend a lot of it, but it is really critical, to cultivate, facilitate, and develop new world-class advanced manufacturing innovative technology solutions for Canadian food processors to achieve productivity, innovation, sustainability, and commercialization targets. And we do that through collaborative consortia, which is one of our major points of difference. Importantly though, the technology we bring to food isn't off the shelf. If it's off the shelf, if we have a challenge from a food processor, and they say, well, oh, I can solve that. Let me, let me go to Fanuc and I can buy it. That's the part of your capital program. That's not, that's not applied engineering research for, it can't be off the shelf. We wanna create new and innovative technologies. We want lower cost technology. When I was at Maple Leaf, we bought 10 robotics units at a million and a half each. An SME is not gonna be able to afford a million and a half for a robotic unit. I say, bring it down to 150. There's a skill in taking, keeping the value there and driving the cost out. That's what we gotta focus on. Integrate existing technology into new working applications. I got something there, something there, something there, this is existing, we put them together in a different way and it leads to a new application. It's not reinventing the wheel, but it's delivering something different. Add value to an existing technology. And take imported technology. One of the things that came out of our tour in, in, uh, in uh, Holland and Germany was there are companies that want to come to Waterloo Region with patent technology, and they don't want to show us, show us up. What they want to do is they say, we want you to take 
your expertise in technology and take us to the next level because we can't get there now. So we want you to add value and we've got a company called Food Case, a company called Provolor, a company called OHA, I think a couple others, I can't remember the name. So, I mean, that's really important for us. We have a, a three stream model and this can get a little complicated, but let me describe it in, in simplest terms. The first stream simply says, and this is part of, this says, we go to a food processor, identify a challenge, it's vetted and all those things. Then we bring in a consortium of likely a, a fabricator technology integrator, maybe an academic institution, but in this case, probably unlikely. They work to solve the problem. What the food processor gets is the prototype working in his facility, no charge, and we help him with shred to reduce the cost of that, of that R&D. Then the IP doesn't go to the food processor, it goes to the consortium group, and they decide, ideally, that they can commercialize it on their own, or through the Accelerator Center, or through Communitech, or through one of our, obviously, vehicles we have. So that's, that's stream one. Stream two is the first, there's two stages. The first stage is simply you've identified a technology challenge, a need. You bring in a group of third or fourth year engineers. The food processor provides 5,000 in cash, 5,000 in kind, potentially the student group goes after an insert grant or something, or gets some money, maybe $20,000, $25,000. Their role is to solve the problem, create a technology engineering design that says, this will work, maybe an alpha prototype that's, that's been well modeled, but obviously hasn't been proven. At that point, the academic institution students can either stop and turn it over to fabricator, technology integrator, or they can be part of, with the IP, part of the movement into this larger collaborative consortium, which is important, and then commercialize. But we've got to build the prototype and we've got to put it in, in, the, uh, in the food processors, obviously, facility, make sure it's working. Um, the third component is simply, <coughs> There's an incredible amount of engineering talent from a faculty standpoint. How do we ensure that we take advantage of that? And what we would do is we would connect or network uh, anybody that wants particular food processing problems. And there are some, some processing problems that really are really absolutely applied and there aren't as much basic research. And that's not what faculty member would like. He wants to publish, he wants to do some research, those kind of good things. So it's important that we network and work with them. Now, we are a facilitator there. We don't kind of manage that process, but we're a facilitator. We work with you on the process to make sure that you meet the right people, you get the challenges. We bring challenges to, obviously, to the faculty. So that's the, that's the three streams. I guess our point of difference is we are the only Tech for Food initiative in Canada. There are a couple in the US. But surrounded by this, there should be a box that says collaboration and collaboration among groups of people. So we've got a food processing network and ecosystem, which again includes, includes Guelph. We've got a technology ecosystem, which I'd argue is Waterloo Region with all the good things that are there. And we bring, and the overlap, it's either creating a new tech for food ecosystem or a tech for food ecosystem within the context of both those two systems. But we've got a proven ecosystem in Waterloo Wellington. We've got a proven technology system in, in Waterloo Region. Combining those together drives prosperity, jobs, new products, new markets, and, and economic activity. 
We're also doing this in, in three phases. I'm not trying to complicate this, but our first phase is one of the regions in southwestern Ontario. We want to prove our model. As we said earlier, we're working with Pillars, Conestoga Meats, and Brick Brewery. We want to make sure that we can go back to everybody, the food processors, academic institutions, technology and fabricators that work with us and say, listen, you know, we've proven this works, this model works. Phase two is to go to the balance of Ontario. And phase three is to take it to the balance of Canada and open it internationally. We want to be supplying product. We want to be supplying equipment outside Europe. And this outside Canada. And we know this, this is going to take time, but I believe as Canadians that we can do it. So the current status, we've got three projects have been identified and assessed in the phase one. Pillars Meat, which is addressing a production line food safety issue. Conestoga Meats, we use robotics and sensor technology to trim carcass and, and trim waste. Again, none of this is available at this point now. And Brook, Brook Brewing, we, we're looking at some CBOD issues that they have in, in, their, in their facility. So these business cases and funding applications for these three projects target submission for early, early February. Uh, and we're, we're just working through the final scoping to make sure that obviously that we say it's a $300,000 project. If it's a 400 or a, let's, let, me, let me exaggerate. If it goes from a 300 to a $900,000 project, not likely, then the food processor needs to put instead of 50,000, he's got to triple his, his input. The, the fabricator technology integrator have to change from 50,000 in kind to 150,000 in kind. And that, that's, the way, uh, that's the way we will work it. The collaborative consortium is one of, I think, our unique selling points, but is collaboration is, and commercialization are inextricably missed, are mixed. Our critical metric is our ability to commercialize. If we don't commercialize, we're not a success. If we only help individual food processors, then we haven't been successful. We're trying to help the industry on a broad base. Collaboration is defined as working together, especially in a joint intellectual effort. Commercialization is the process by which new knowledge and technology are transformed into economically successful products, process, and services. Now, I'm sure there's 100 other definitions, but those are the two I like. But there are at least partial definitions because there's one essential element, and that's collaboration and commercialization is all about people and all about collaboration, all about collaboration and, and that right consortium. So, uh, a slightly revised, I would say, the pro this is the comedy, a process by which people work together with shared values, responding to markets, transforming new knowledge and technology into economically successful products, processes, and services. People drive collaboration and commercialization, and again, the most innovative ideas and useful technology will not move beyond the lab or beyond the food processor unless people are interested in working together. And it's a skill to do that. Our collaborative consortium is absolutely critical with applied research partnerships. And that's the only way we're going to get innovations and technologies, obviously, that, that work. Now, large companies tend to have commercialization infrastructure built in because of their size, small and medium-sized businesses need commercialization assistance. That's one of the reasons we're focusing on SMEs. 30% of businesses complete unsuccessfully in the market without collaborating with industry peers. If you don't, if you don't do any collaborate, and collaborating doesn't mean a food processor with a food processor, although we'd like that to happen over time. It's collaboration with academic industry. It's collaboration with fabricators, collaboration with technology integrators. When I talk to Ray Silcock, the chairman of Toyota, he said, you know, what, you know what the University of Waterloo does best? You know what their biggest lever for us is? Is all the engineers, high quality engineers we hire. And yeah, the faculty's good and we give them $10 million to do this research over a long term period of time that really d does good work. But the primary focus is, just like Conestoga does, the high quality graduates 
I mean, you go to, I was at uh, somebody in Stratford, D&D Automation. 90% of their people are graduates of Conestoga College on the engineering and, and fabricating side. I mean, that's, that's incredible, that's terrific. Um, but to compete and survive, SMEs need to collaborate among themselves with collaborative consortium partners, and that's not a way of life, but we're bringing, we're bringing it to life. I wanna talk a little bit about, about some, uh, Shirley gave me some names of people that were potentially interested, and I'm just gonna mention the names to talk about what they may be interested in, and this isn't a commitment, this is just in a broad sense, but CTFF wants to work with you, whether it be stream one, stream two, stream three, we will try to make it easy for you to work with us. You know, we've got leverage, we've got a collaborative consortium, we've got contacts, networking introductions, we will customize, tailor, and support in a way that will make it easy for you to work with us. And I'm just gonna quickly go, you know, Bill Anderson talked about in, in, the, in the bio, he was interested in food safety. Carolyn Wren talked about detection of fat percentage and other components, such as proteins. Jonathan Kaufman said, talked about food inspection, which is big. Ray, Ray Leg or Legge, that identification of value-added constituents from agricultural residues. Some of that I don't understand, but it sounds pretty good. Um, <laughs> Frank Gu, food safety and development. Terrific. Hung Su Li, energy recovering wastewater treatment. That's incredible. It's effluence, it's water, it's recycling. Marco Klein, sterilizations of liquid by UV and detection of viruses. Murray Mu Young, who's, there we are here, and I, you're the only one that I really didn't understand, but <laughs> uh, rheological characterization of non-Newtonian food materials, and it sounds really important, but we met with, <laughs> we met with Murray and Shirley, and we had a terrific meeting, and they're really, they're really committed to University of Waterloo and to technology, and I think we're getting them really committed to technology and, and food. Uh, Christine uh, Morosoli, and uh, is Christine here? I don't think so, but we met with Christine, and she's very interested in working with us um, on, on, on some student projects, with protein processes and, and, uh, and products. What I wanted to do is I wanted to talk about, um, and I won't spend too much time, how much time have I got? Um, Five minutes? minutes? 10 minutes, okay. Um, I've got a list of projects that the food processors identified to us. And please understand this is, I'm not gonna go through every one in detail, but this is given in, in layman's terms. I converted them to layman's terms as best I could so that when we're looking for funding that they're, under, they're obviously understood. But food safety and traceability is an incredible project. And it's, this is a huge project. We see this as potentially a five to $10 million project. Because what we want to do is, we really want to, from start of input raw materials, or maybe even from the farm, but starting with input raw materials into the manufacturing process, till it goes to the DC, we want to have an integrated system that is lower cost, higher, higher efficient, and is affordable by SMEs. What's happening is, the retail trade across Canada said, if you're not GFSI certified, which is a world certification, by January 2015, you can't supply me. A lot of SMEs, and I'm gonna say about 70% at this point, are saying, I'm not gonna do that, that's just a cash grab by the government. And that's the kind of, now it makes no sense. And you know, Gord and I, Gord keeps saying, Ted, it makes no sense, why would they do that? It, it doesn't make any sense, but it's a, fact, it's a fact of life. These people aren't stupid, but sometimes they're entrepreneurs and they're, they're a little stubborn. So I think, you know, we see this as a, a, big, a big project, and this is a project that would take a number of years. One of the things we're, we're, we're going to do in July or August, uh, Mer Halloran's going to come with us. We're going to bring some um, faculty from the University of Waterloo and from the University of Guelph who are coming in, and we're going to lay out our integrated plan. And Doug is, is on the CTF board, will be coming with us. Um, we're gonna lay out what we think an integrated plan would look like, and we're gonna show them some ideas 
to keep the cost really inexpensive. For example, to measure listeriosis, my understanding it takes 24 to 48 hours. There's a professor at University of Waterloo, Dr. Saini, who can do it with an iPhone in a half an hour. Now, if that's absolutely true, and I believe it is, because we've seen it, and he's, he's, work, he's starting to go to, uh, he's alpha, he's trying to go to, go, to, go to beta. That's incredible, and it's very low cost. We've got, a tr we've got a incredible traceability system that, shun shun? I mean, I may not be saying it right. Pardon, pardon me if I'm offending anybody, but um, it's, it's, a, it's an incredible traceability system that is the best I've ever seen. We've also got an ozonating system, which takes ozone, sorry, ozonizing to the next level, which is preventative, which gets rid of all the bacteria in, in protein and reduces the cost of washing, and it's re really, really low cost. So we'll, we'll do that with Bruce Archibald, who was the president of FedDev, uh, and who is now the president of CFIA. And I've got a whole bunch of these. I don't want to go through them all, but you know, pork side rib, um, removing side rib from pork belly is all done by hand. And there's some, a lot of ergonomic, there's labor involved. When we've identified the savings on these, we didn't do any yield. It was all labor. So we go from unskilled labor to skilled labor. We may get rid of 10 unskilled. We add two back, but we model it to the point where over a three to five year period between the company growing, becoming more profitable, adding a few more people, the growth of, of fabricators, technology integrators, that we net 1 point, 1 point, or about 15% more people over the three to five year period. If you put the yield in, so in other words, I'm hacking all this stuff by hand, the bunch of, a bunch of butchers, the, 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 the piece before is working at 50 units a minute. It could work at 100, but because, because there's no automation here, it's gotta work at 50. We get this to 50 through technology, this goes up to 100. Now, that savings isn't, we said, let's be conservative. So it's just the labor saving. It's not the throughput and the yield, which, it, which means that the savings are significantly higher. Um, pork side ribs, there's, and it, you know, the, the, the savings for this business themselves is $200,000 $250,000 annually per shift. In Canada, given 30 manufacturers similar to that, it's 18 to 25 million. And if you go in, the, if everybody buys one, the savings would be 180 to 225 million. Now that's not likely, but it shows the magnitude that these aren't one-offs. There's an opportunity on the commercialization side. Stuffing cabbage rolls. I mean, there's two components of stuffing cabbage rolls. One, all the cabbage is purchased in California. The cost to transport it is $500,000. I mean, the cost saving just on a producer side here and we're working with the University of Guelph and, and Vineland on, on trying to remedy that. The other is just cabbage rolls are rolled and stuffed by hand. Because once the cabbage is treated, it's flexible, or they're different sizes. We need, we need some, something to replace those unskilled workers and put them together. And there's a significant savings on that. You know, three shifts. Now this guy does an extraordinary amount of <coughs> cabbage rolls too. Three shifts, 600,000 to $1.2 million. And this is not throughput, this is just labor savings. And in Canada, there's 30 businesses about, so we're talking 18 to 36 million. And in the US, North America, we're talking significantly higher. Uh, frozen lasagna, simple thing like lasagna noodles are layered by hand because they're so brittle, or not brittle, they're so tender, and I don't know what the writer in the fragile, and then they're all done by hand. Why? Costs them a lot of money. We have some technology that can do that. That saves a significant amount of dollars. And I'll go. Th don't need stuffed chicken, fresh chicken, specialty fruit. There's a company in Kitchener that does serves about 70% share of the fruit, salad, and vegetable market all across Canada, ships a lot in the States. When, when, they're, when they're cutting oranges and grapefruits, they have no problem. When they're doing mangoes and, and pineapples and other specialty avocados, the yield goes down dramatically. 
They're competing against Mexico that does it by hand and so cheap that they, can't, they won't put capital in. Is there technology that allow us to, to, to effectively do the specialty fruit, which is significantly more expensive? I'm going to say somebody can do it. And there's obviously a lot of money involved there. Wastewater and there's our issue with, or not issue, but our challenge with BRIC is, is on the wastewater side. And we're working actually with Niagara College um, um, and KL Products, the fabricator in, uh, in London. And we're working with Niagara Falls, uh, or Niagara Falls, a Niagara College simply because they're an expert in water, an expert in beer, and an expert in wine. And they've gone through that effluent and recycling with these type of facilities. Premium apples, who's the big apple guy here? I mean, taking apple, now this is big. Taking, it's all done by hand. And the only technology they've, they've only get so far is something that shakes the tree, it falls into some kind of a blanket, and they all get bruised. The saying is there's something that can, that can match, and I know University of Guelph is working on this with tomatoes, and tomatoes, in my mind, are probably tenderer than apples. You know, to pick this at a rate that is better and faster and cheaper than all the labor you bring in. So there's an opportunity, and that, hap that happens to be Martin's Apple. They're a, what I'll call a, I think, or you call them a farm processor, I think, because they do apple chips and um, food waste. This is a big project, and you know, how do we, how do we, you know, we're not going to end food, you know, world hunger. But so much of our food is wasted, and 40% of, of our food doesn't get, is wasted, sorry, it doesn't get, it, it, it is simply wasted, and that's, so the percent of waste in Canada, farmer's field is, is 10%, 9%, packaging and processing is 18, transportation distribution is 3, uh, retail is 11, food, food service is 8, home is 51%. Now, I talked to somebody the other day, I don't know how you address the home, but there's a need there. Maybe you can, I don't know. You have to under, we have to understand more about what, uh, what is uh, obviously going on. Just quickly, the future of, uh, of technology. There's something called omni-channeling, uh, omni which is an opportunity at retail, which really is bringing computers, mobile internet devices, direct mail, catalogs, TV, radio, um, distribution product on sale into one into one unit which enhances the shopping experience for the consumer at retail now that's I mean the shopping experience at retail is is something that marketers and food companies and retailers have been trying to do for years but now with the state of technology maybe we can bring that all together and create some excitement through that and make it efficient. Push button ordering, you know, simply online stuff and you've ordered in the grocery store and it comes and it's delivered to you, however, a hundred different ways. Digital manufacturing, um, let me give you some, nanotechnology. I mean, that market is $25.2 billion and, and they believe in 10 years it's going to be one trillion and it's, and again, it's delivering special friendly foods you know nano, nano food nanotechnology will take add strengths to a particular food product that wasn't there before there are issues with that um, but i mean just like gmo but we can we can i think get through that so there's huge uh, synthetic biology and biologic evolution um, we can speed up evidently uh, Evidently, biologic evolution hap took thousands of years to handle. We can do it faster than it was ever before. So we can see what happens, and that will give us, obviously, key learning. <laughs> Biologically tele teleportation. Send digital information, and then recreate the biology at the other end. I mean, people are thinking about that, and I read an article that talked about they're actually doing that. Now, I can't imagine. Gord, I mean, it's just, just amazing, just amazing stuff. But you do it with, you know, vaccines can be sent around the world in less than a second. And that's not food, but that's 
That's good stuff. The technology can add value. Intelligent knife, nanorobots to improve the efficiency of the digestive system that happens, that is there all the time in your stomach and that, that, that eliminates ulcers, eliminates stomach ache. I mean, who knows what it, what it eliminates? So it's, it's incredible. Um, robotic food preparation. Hospitals anywhere, restaurants, who, I mean, who knows? Um, this is a what if. Um, so I guess at the end of the next steps, and I've gone through that quickly, and I do apologize for the speed at which I went through that, but the CTF metric is, is commercialization, is collaboration to commercialization. We want to make it easy to collaborate, to work with everybody. We'll bend over backwards to do that. Um, we're not going to have a lot of fixed costs. We're going to have a lot of variable costs. And we're going to be sustainable over five years because one of the things we're going to do is of the food processor savings, we'll probably take 5%. So what we want to do is we want to make sure the government is looking clearer and clearer and trying to make things sustainable. So if, if they don't give you money the next year, are you around? And there's examples this year where they didn't get government money and, and things had to fall. And the government can't be an endless source because that's our tax dollars that are doing that. So we got to take advantage of the untapped opportunity, particularly in the food side, and that's by bringing technology to food. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you very much, Ted, Mayor Brenda Halloran. Uh, we have some time for questions now, so we certainly have the room until 5, and I don't think there's a lot of time pressure on that as well. So please, I'd invite you to to speak what's on your mind and maybe open up a bit of a discussion and I'm going to ask Christina to come around and bring the microphone to people so that it gets captured, your voice gets captured on the video. Don't be shy about that. Uh, yeah. Ted, very nice. Uh, appreciate your coming here and talking to us about it. Maybe you could give us a, a, a flavor of, because I've done a little bit of this with the local industries and the automated, automated systems guys. What, what's your feeling with those people? I've often asked them about this, replacing the 95% of imported equipment that we use, but they always say, yeah, well, great, but get Maple Leaf or Pillars to, to engage us in doing this. Uh, is that something similar that you've seen, or are you seeing some more... Uh, uptake or uh... they, they the top line they don't see it as their responsibility but after talking to them a little bit at drilling down and that's the benefit of of one-on-one -on -one interviews as opposed to questionnaire they start realizing that that they can do as much you know with the challenge that they have if they were if they work with us they can contribute to that and again it's it's their most important focus is you're solving my problem, right? And the fact that we're commercializing it for the industry, they don't really care, to be honest with you. But over time, I hope this leads to you know, more food processor collaboration, and I don't mean over the next year or two years, you know, over the next five, 10 years, because the food industry is a great industry. It's a fun industry. It's, an, it's a, a re really relevant industry, and we've got to be a little more proactive, and that's why We've taken a small piece, that's technology and food, and trying to push forward. I can't change, or we can't change their supply management regulations. We can't change the regulations. You know, let's control what we can control, and we can control technology into food and on small, medium-sized businesses. We can work with that and aggressively accelerate that and improve the industry by doing that. And over time, the regulations, if they're wrong, they will change over time, I believe. Right, Gord? Hi, my name is Alexandra. I'm from NSERC, so one of the federal funding agencies. And obviously, we have money for both the university side and the college side to partner with companies to do these collaborative projects. But we were talking about one of the best resources are the students. And in fact, we are. We were chatting before the break, and sorry, your name is Ian. 
Morgan has done three student internships with Maple Leaf. So she's in her final year and she's considering, you know, does she do more school? Does she look at work? And this is something I think that more SMEs need to be aware of is the fact that there's this terrific resources in the students that can help bring the actual knowledge transfer to their companies and they can offset some of the risk to them because NSER can help pay for part of that as well too. And we also have it for the colleges. So this is a great chance for the students to get in and work with these small companies on these projects. I, I, I agree with you. I, one of the things that we've set up with Velocity is we said, listen, we talked about CTFF with Velocity and said, would anybody like a plant? We're trying to create interest in the food business. Um, and Velocity said, well, could, would you give us a tour? Well, today, I got an email that said, there's 50 kids that want to come, 50 kids, sorry, 50, <laughs> sorry, showing my age, 50 young students, bright students, that want to come at the same time. I said, well, we can't put 50 in a plant for a tour, but if we do them five to eight at a time, then you can get some value out of it. And I'm, it hasn't been done in the food industry. I mean, Maple Leaf is, is standing above the crowd, Kraft Foods is, all those. SMEs don't, recognize the, op they're starting to recognize it, that there are opportunities, they need to take advantage of opportunities. And you know, Maple Leaf, they don't think should be allowed to take advantage of those, but I mean, Maple Leaf's just smarter. I mean, be as smart as Maple Leaf, take advantage of those opportunities. It's trying to help because the backbone of everything we're doing here is, is the graduates, is the students. That's gonna, that's gonna change the food industry. I'm not gonna change it. I'm gonna be maybe a catalyst, but the students, you know, high quality students that come out of University of Guelph, University of Waterloo, Niagara College, are gonna be the driving force behind food and we gotta create interest and we gotta show that there's some, and that there's an ROI here. Um, and I think that's important. I completely agree with you. And that's why we're, we're trying to give tours. Pillars is gonna to give tours. DC Foods is gonna, Elmira Poultry is giving tours. They're gonna to get tired of giving tours, but they're, they're creating some interest. In, 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 in the food business, which is, again, so relevant and so much of an opportunity. I wouldn't work for Maple Leaf Foods. There are other smaller companies where you can get some equity and get really involved. <laughs> They're a good company, though. I, I have a, a, a comment rather than a okay, Marie, sure. question. Um, uh, this is a very great overview. But I think uh, we need a sequel of this uh, thing to address these challenges in the technology. I'm sorry you, you, you gave us an overview, but the engineers and the students, they'd like to know a little bit more about where is the intellectual part that's going to be. You know, they talk about cabbages and lettuce and tomatoes. And I think if I was a young student, I would say, well, how can I contribute to this with all these different things. That's one comment. The second one is so that next time, we are logical characterization of non-Newtonian <laughs> foods. <laughs> we are logical is a fancy is scientific term that describes the viscosity vari variability of a material. Thank you. Non-Newtonian describes the fact that a lot of food material is not like water or with um, air or something. The viscosity is changing. So those of you who are old enough like me will know that if your mom is trying to make a cake mix in the kitchen and she tries to do it very fast, big problem because it thickens up. That's one area of non-Newtonian fluid which is gotcha. called dilatant non-Newtonian okay. fluids. Blood, on the other hand, which is another type, is the op opposite. It's a pseudoplastic non-Newtonian fluid. <laughs> so why is it important? Well, as you know, uh, Ted, I'm sure in the old days with extrusion of food, when the workers are trying to do it very quickly on Friday afternoon, it breaks the, char uh, the, the, the shaft of the extruder. Or the end of shift on the Because day, yeah. it's a dilated material, the dough. And so uh, hopefully you didn't mind me giving me a little mini lecture of what <laughs> logical characterization of non fuel fluids. But the first comment I think is very important. I, I hope that we'll have a, 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 a
um, uh, as, as a professor and students, they got, some of them are here, gonna say, oh, well, what are we supposed to do about these, uh, these different type of fluids? Well, this rheological non it's got a, a commonality of uh, ignorance which got to be addressed so that the technology can be improved and you don't have any more breakage of uh, shafts of extruder, food extruders, <laughs> or, or your mom and dad might oh, mom, you mustn't try to do it very quickly because <laughs> this cake mix won't go too well. Thank you very much. I, I, Murray, I, I absolutely agree with you. I guess the, my, my, my point would be we can, we can drill down. Is, there is a difference between high tech and food. I mean, it's not quite as glitzy as maybe you're used to. But there are, I mean, there are intellectual properties. There are ways, obviously, we can deliver it. And we can get down into more detail on that next time if you, if you ever want us back. Gordon? It's very important to note that, though, because uh, that's one of the reasons I think, if I may say so, a lot of engineers don't go to a lot of food engineering because they think, you know, what is this? You know, they don't kind of see the excitement of uh, non-Newtonian properties. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, first, a comment, uh, Gord Surgeon or Ontario Agri-Food Technologies, but Ted, you've come a long way since our, my, the first board meeting I went to, and congratulations, I think. Thank you. We've talked a lot about this vision, you and I, back and forth. Yes. And I guess it, it all crystallized when I had the meeting with Jason with Food Case, uh, out of Wagenen, you know, supplying meals to the airline industry, all the problems, they've got a solution, we've got manufacturing, and very importantly, what they said is, it's going to involve the quality of the inputs, the food itself coming in, but it's, I need IT, you know, I don't care where. We're going to be in this region for our head, head office for Canada, and we're going to have to get them so we make all the product for the U.S. as well. But, yes. But, the, but it was that combination of the IT, the advanced manufacturing, food traceability, and they saw this as their entry point to North America, and I congratulate you for going and I think we have to learn from what the Dutch have done, and then we just have to be implementing it, and I congratulate the city for moving forward on this as well. Thank you, Gord. Hi, I'm uh, Chef Philip Sarriva. I'm a coordinator of uh, culinary programs here at Conestoga, and my comment for you would be, um, I, I'm, from, I'm from France, and in France, a lot of the uh, food processors have a good alliance with the chef association. Uh, we have experts in food, we process food. And one of the things I notice a lot is the public, a reason that maybe does not like the processed food, or we run into problems of making processed food taste good to the consumer, is because we don't view it as a chef views it. So my, one of my comments would be, do you ever consider getting uh, chef associations or uh, chefs involved in the project, maybe give you a different view of not just making food for profit, making it easier through a processing plant, but also making it taste good in a way that a consumer would buy it, and therefore less of a waste in the end. So just have a comment. I, I think, I think, I think you're- in France, a lot of food processors get chefs uh, uh, involved. If you look in Montreal, for example, we have a great chef in Montreal named uh, uh, Jérôme Ferrer from one of maybe the top restaurants in, in Canada, Europea, and he created his own food processing plant. Yes. He is actually manufacturing good food and consumer will buy it. So we have to change a little bit the perception that people have of processed food. It's just food made easier for maybe uh, storage or uh, shelf life, but he has to retain the value of good food. And I think in the last 50 years in North America, we lost that aspect that food should taste good. We don't want that Twinkie that's going to last 50 years. I, listen, to have I think, I think you're good. absolutely right. The person who can, I, and I'm convinced of that. I, I would say that two years ago I met with Gary Hallam and we had a long discussion and he convinced me, quite frankly, um, that in theory every food processor should have a chef on staff as part of their R&D, not just technical people, but R&D people when you're doing, re I mean, recipes shouldn't be done by technical people. They should, they should start with, with chefs and move to the technical people under the supervision of chefs. So I categorically agree that. We're trying to find a way, Mayor Haller and I were talking about, is there a food institute or something we can do 
Can we work with the University of Guelph and, and have, make sure that small, uh, medium-sized food processors can have access to a chef? They don't think about that, and they should be thinking about that, because their R&D is likely the daughter or the wife, and they're probably great cooks, but there's a difference between a chef and, and a daughter and a, and, and a wife when it comes to that, because that's, that's, that's a functional an expertise, as is technology as a functional expertise, too. I completely agree. Just maybe to add just to that, uh, in the other side, uh, the If you've got some ideas, I'd be happy to meet with you and, and particularly Gary and anybody, because I think it's a great idea. But well, we hope that Conestoga can do that at some point. Louis? Yeah. Uh, can I just uh, maybe segue from that? Uh, I remember a few years back, a uh, decade ago at least, um, President's Choice uh, took a pate from Winston's restaurant, which would have cost a fortune. And I remember a pate that was good before that point cost a fortune. All of a sudden, they brought it at Christmas time in a sort of a, a big tub at reasonable price, but extremely high uh, quality. Uh, I commend you on, on working with the industry to try and pull. Uh, actually, uh, in a previous job, uh, quite a few years ago, I had a company in the uh, uh, fresh products processing business from Mississauga trying to uh, get some help from a university down the road on, uh, on vegetable processing. And it turned out they had no mechanical engineers down the road anymore because what used to be a big pull from industry, short line equipment, manufacturing, everything dried up, and so did the academics to respond to it. So you mentioned the in Niagara College and, and the, uh, the beer processing. Interesting thing, as you would have found out, they started with wine, but then the craft brewing industry said, whoa, exactly. we like what you've done, and we like the expertise coming out, we like the, the knowledge that's being developed, can we create our own craft brewing industry or, or school with you as well? You didn't see our big brewers doing that. As Canadians, we still say that we pr produce great beer. Excuse me, we don't. If you want great beer, you go to the States, not for Budweiser, but for all the craft brewery <laughs> brews that they make there. In fact, the Europeans are even learning from them. So we really need to, to, to link, and you're working hard on this, but link the market pull through industry, and we've got to somehow get industry to understand that they have to keep reinvesting and stay competitive. I hate it, and I used to be a trade commissioner, I hate it when our dollar dives like it has this month. Because you know what happens? Our manufacturers stop investing in plant and equipment and technology. They stop. They just drop shovel right then. Absolutely. Oh, I'm not going to spend money. I'm going to live off this weak currency. And the best thing that ever happened, and I saw this in my previous job, was that when the dollar went up and was at par, all of a sudden the phone started ringing and saying, you know, we've done things this way for a long time, but now we either have to throw in the towel, we don't want to do that, or we have to be more innovative and do things differently. And I'll just end on one thing. I'm going home for a conference call with our trade office in Tokyo, uh, who are liaising between uh, Waterloo University and a, a large Japanese multinational that's looking at building closer ties with the university. We have companies from around the world coming to this region to access our expertise. What we'd really like to see is more companies from down the road coming down here to access our expertise. And Ted, right. you're doing a great job to help that. Thank you. Luis Garcia with the Institute of Food Process and Technology at Conestoga College. Just a short comment on what, uh, what um, Chef Philippe was uh, mentioning. We are, as Conestoga are working to, um, towards a plan where we will integrate food process and technology and uh, the School of uh, Hospitality and the culinary programs so that we can do exactly what you were mentioning. Uh, and just to, uh, on your comment of um, the 
use or the opportunity of uh, chefs getting involved in food manufacturing. Uh, when Food Case, that company that was mentioned by uh, Gord, um, came to Canada, uh, we introduced them to five companies that would, uh, we thought would be capable of uh, manufacturing the meals that we're looking for, and four out of those five have chefs uh, on staff. Uh, they have identified that that is a key uh, role that uh, food technologists and food scientists cannot, uh, cannot uh, conduct. So um, I guess the more visionary companies uh, are looking at that already. Uh, it may be uh, at, sl at a slow pace, but it is, it is coming. Thank you. Hi, my name is Doug Chapman, and I've spent going on 35 years in and around the food processing industry. This week, I joined Ted's group as a project manager, manager on these three pilot programs. But I just wanted to mention a couple of uh, things, because the word engineers come up a lot here today. There's an organization called the Canadian Institute of Food Science and Technology. And I'm on the board of the Ontario section. And you might be interested to know that a year ago, we were invited to a career night at the engineering school of the University of Toronto. And three of us went down there and did a bit of a dog and pony show, tried to interest pure engineers in the food processing industry and why it might be something interesting to look at. Well, this week, we just got invited back. The CIFST is going to put $5,000 into a competition, and they've got 10 teams from the engineering school who are going to produce sort of 20, 30 page papers on relevant topics in the food processing industry. And yours truly has been asked to be a judge on, on that. So suddenly I went from making a half an hour presentation to investing a week reading papers. But <laughs> it's not out of the question if this school wants to do something like that. We can connect and bring a couple people in here with food science experience and talk about career opportunities and things of that sort. So that's a, just a, an opportunity. The other thing I wanted to mention, I've heard the word chef a lot here um, this afternoon. I ran the product development department at one of Unilever's operating companies in Canada for many years. And we had basically a food service business and a bakery business. On the food service side, yes, we had a chef. On the bakery side, we had two European trained master bakers. And the whole objective was, for them to work with a client, if you were working one-on-one -on -one with a client, come up with a recipe that everybody liked, and then somebody with a food technology background had to take that recipe and make the thing relevant to the food industry. First of all, the cost was always about five times higher than anybody could ever live with. The ingredients weren't industrially available, all of those sorts of, sorts of issues. But as an operating way, it is absolutely the way to go. You need a combination of the two. The other comment I'll make is when a chef develops a product, especially a chef in a very high-end restaurant, it has to have a shelf life of what, 15 minutes? It, until it gets to the table and is consumed. A product that's coming out of a food plant, a short shelf life is three months. A long one is three years. So it's a totally different game as well. However, they're obviously linked. If you want to know what the trends are in the food industry, you go to California and see what's happening in the restaurant industry, because those are the new trends that are coming in food processing. So anyway, just a, a couple of comments. I think that's where collaboration is critical on both sides, chef to tech, tech to tech, chef, and on both cases. Just to comment on that, um, I'm no expert, I'm not a, I'm, I just cook for a living, but um, looking back at the slides that you talk about, about waste, talking about products being manufactured with three year shelf life, but don't sell, that just sits there because the customer's taste has changed. How many of those canned foods that are now on shelf, millions of them, go expire because the consumer is not buying it? We have to realize what the customer wants. And if you see where people go to eat and what they want to eat, they're going for fresh, they don't want something that has shelf life forever. Now, yes, technology out there. If you look in Europe, the amount of sous vide products that's available in all shelves that gives you a good quality, yet a decent shelf life. Most high-end restaurants are using sous vide right now, and they're not using technology in Canada. 
I remember a couple of years ago, a New Zealand lamb brought some sous vide products in the shelves in the supermarkets. People are looking at that with their eyes wide open and say, what the heck is that? Yet it's popular in Europe. If we're looking at technology versus food and waste, we have to take a look at what technology can do for us. And if we can produce products efficiently at good cost, why do we want them sitting there three years? Right? We want to be able to move that product. So we have to move a product by giving what the customer wants. And I think sometimes the industry has changed, thinking that if we make it, they will buy it. Why not make what they want to buy? And that's the chef's point of view of it. I think basically the whole objective is to make what people want to buy. And my understanding of the retailing industry is if you're not meeting their objectives within three months, you're off the shelf. There is not millions of cans of product sitting on the sh shelves of supermarkets and things of that sort. Also, we've mentioned the Twinkie here a couple of times. Um, that stuff's coming back. I know. It's scary. It's scary. Well, that tells you somebody wants to buy it. Now, maybe you can comment on the, on, on the quality of the palate in the United States. And in Canada, you can make a different comment. It never went away. It's comfort food. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, somebody wants to buy that stuff. And if they do, well, I suppose somebody will make it for them. But, uh, yeah. But, uh, but certainly the whole, I, I agree with you 100% that the combination of using chef talent at the creative end of the process and then using the technology piece to make it a, a viable business proposition outside of a restaurant is the way to go. Collaboration, collaboration, collaboration. That's what it's all about. I think we'll wrap up now. One final thank you. I do want to follow up on Murray's suggestion that we have a, yes. a sequel to today's event. I'd like to make that sequel a bit more directed, maybe more of a, a round table kind of discussion where we identify some real I targets for future Absolutely. collaboration and a real pathway ahead so that we move one step further. So, Professor that I am, I'm going to leave you with a little bit of homework to start thinking in that direction so that you come prepared to our next meeting. And I'll just kind of conclude saying stay tuned for Food Tech 2. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Thank you.